Well, praise the Lord, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday morning Sanctuary Bible class at New Life Austin. So glad that you're able to join us today, and we're looking forward to a great day of worship in the house of the Lord, and trust that you will be with us in our online services throughout the day, and uh, that you will avail yourself of that. Trust that you are all doing well, and of course, as we often say, we are looking forward to the time when we can see you again. Uh, but until then, we're thankful for this opportunity for us to gather together in this way. And the Lord has been good to us, been preserving and protecting and, and uh, keeping us through this time. So grateful for that and feel a real encouragement in uh, the direction that things are going these days and hopeful that we will be able to get together again soon. And uh, let's just start this morning our time together with a word of prayer, invite the presence of the Lord in, invite Him to have His way in our time in His Word this morning. Lord, we're so grateful for the opportunity to be together and to be together with Your people and to be together with You, knowing that Your Spirit is not limited by any of the things that would limit us, but Lord, You are able to reach into our hearts and into our homes and into our lives, wherever we may be. And we're asking this morning that the Word of God would do just that. You had promised us that the Word is alive and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and that it pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is able to discern between the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Lord, we're trusting this morning, knowing that Your Word is not bound, but that it is able to reach from where we are to where our listeners, our hearers are this morning. And we entrust you, Lord. We're looking to you. We know that you are our strength. You are the one who makes these things possible. So by your spirit, Lord, we ask that you would accompany your word this morning and allow it, help it to reach into our hearts, to feed us and to strengthen us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, of course, we are continuing in John chapter 11, and this is a well-known story, the entire chapter given really to this one story of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And uh, this story is, uh, as I say, it is a well-known story, but there is a good deal of rich detail in these verses as we go through them. And I want us to spend this time that we have together mining those details, mining that richness, and uh, partaking of that and allowing it to feed us and to strengthen us. It is, um, we might be tempted to say ironic or coincidental that we would be at uh, this point and we would be discussing these verses in the midst of a pandemic when we face some of the very issues that are raised in this chapter. But we do know that the Spirit has its way and it orders our steps and it brings us to certain points in life. And uh, I, would not want to, uh, I would not want to ascribe that to mere coincidence or to irony that we would be here. I believe it is the will of the Lord that we find ourselves in this passage, uh, in these weeks that we have together. And I believe there is real encouragement here. We can observe the behavior of those who come in and out of the narrative of this chapter, and we gain strength from it, and we glean from uh, their behaviors, from their experiences, and from the words of the Lord to them as a means of encouragement. I, I want to read this morning, and I'm going to go back. I know we've been a couple of weeks already in this chapter. I'm just going to read for the sake of context from verse 1, and uh, probably... Uh, going to read down, uh, maybe all the way down to verse 15. Um, and I don't know whether we'll be able to make it all the way down to verse 15 today, but we'll give it a shot. And I, but I would like to read that passage, the first 15 verses of John chapter 11, for your context this morning. Uh, verse 1 of John chapter 11 says, Now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha, 
It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, or will not end in death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of Man, Son of God rather, might be glorified thereby. So this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goest thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. And verse 16, then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So in this passage, we uh, have already noted uh, a number of different things. And last week, uh, I made the point that it seems that there are two overriding themes that are woven throughout this narrative, throughout this chapter. And we will see these two themes crop up over and over again. The first theme is the humanity of Jesus and the fact that he is presented um, in his humanity, and in fact, it is the, um, the stark uh, juxtaposition, if you will, the contrast. They are put in close proximity to each other, not just his humanity, but also his divinity. And we will see those two things, his humanity and his divinity, um, standing right beside each other as we work our way through this narrative. One way in which this makes its appearance early in the chapter here is the fact in verse 5 where the scripture says Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And we remarked last week this is not that divine agape kind of love that is mentioned here, but it is the more human uh, interaction, the human affection, the friendship kind of love, phileo, that Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus as very dear friends. And this in itself is, um, of course, speaking of his humanity. He's coming not as uh, the savior of the world, but he is responding to the cries and to the pleas of Mary and Martha for their brother. He's, he is responding to that out of a personal affection for them. But he's not responding like any other friend would respond, he is bringing to bear all of his divinity, which he will show very plainly by the end of the story. And so we will see this. This is a foreshadowing of what will happen in the remainder of the chapter. The second theme that we will see uh, addressed a number of different times has to do with God's timing and that God has a time and God has a plan and very often that timing and that plan are not ours and they don't um, agree with our timing and with our plan. And we alluded to this a bit last week, verse 6, when Jesus had heard, therefore, that he, Lazarus, was sick, he abode two days still in the same place. So because Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stood still for two days. That seems counter to what we would have expected when Jesus would, uh, we would have expected that one who loved us and who was a dear friend, that when he heard of our great need, he would come running. But 
The scripture said that it was because he heard and because he loved them that he waited. And this, of course, matches with our experience, but does not necessarily uh, alleviate the anxiety sometimes and the tension that we feel because um, it seems to us in the way that we measure things that the time is right for the Lord to act. And uh, my experience, I don't know about you, but my experience more often than not is that God does not seem to act when I feel the time is ripe. And uh, when it seems most opportune for God to undertake, uh, seems like sometimes those are the times when he seems most absent. Uh, but uh, keeping in mind, the scripture said, because he loved them and because he heard that Lazarus was sick, he abode still two days in the same place. And also, the, um, the disciples had their take, I guess, on this timing as well. It probably, that first act anyway, that initial delay, seems to, reading in the rest of the passage here, seems to have fit well with well, their assessment of the situation. And uh, perhaps they inferred from all of this that, um, that Lazarus was not really that sick. Uh, they heard and the Lord said, this sickness is not unto death, but um, this is that the Lord can be, that God can be glorified, the Son of Man can be glorified. And, um, and then the Lord went on about his business. So the disciples, in all likelihood, just passed it off and said, well, that's good. You know, we didn't really have any business going back to Judea and back to Bethany uh, because it wasn't very pleasant the last time that we were there. And no doubt they took some comfort in the delay. But seemingly out of the blue, uh, in verse 7, two days later, the Lord says, let us go into Judea again. A couple of things here. It seems that you will remember that Jesus was, at this time, he was in the wilderness beyond Jordan where John had ministered. And he was... Uh, talking, and uh, we notice this at the end of chapter 10, he was talking with some of John's disciples, and they were seemingly responsive to him. And uh, so he's continuing this ministry, but notice that he is um, easily a full day's journey from Jerusalem and from Bethany. Jerusalem and Bethany very close to each other. Uh, the King James says 15 furlongs means just a couple of miles, and uh, really a by the standards of the day, just a, just a short walk, not very far apart at all. So it would have taken a full day for the messenger to arrive. And uh, then the Lord delays for two days and his journey will take a day back. And uh, we will find later in the story that they will discover that Lazarus has been in the tomb. And in fact, he has been there for four days. And so it seems that um, Lazarus was indeed very sick when Mary and Martha sent the messenger and in fact may have expired shortly after the messenger left. It was the Jewish custom of the day. They did not embalm. They did not take any means to preserve the body. And so it was their custom to bury the dead very quickly. And uh, there were some um, rituals that we may talk about in a little more detail where they would wrap the bodies um, with these windings and they would put spices and so forth in there as a means of masking the inevitable smell that would occur as the body begins to decay. But uh, they did not embalm. They made no effort to preserve that body. They wrapped and they buried very quickly. And uh, so this is the situation in Bethany, and uh, Jesus waits for two days, and uh, then he just out of the blue says, let us go into Judea again. Now, the disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, why, and goest thou thither again? So, are, are you sure you want to do this? Now, it's interesting, the Lord did not say, okay, it's time for us to go and heal Lazarus. His emphasis here is a much wider, much broader emphasis. He says, let us go into Judea again. He wants to make sure that these disciples connect the dots, that they are 
realizing that they are going from a place of exile, of relative safety, of distance away from the ruling parties in the city of Jerusalem, and a relative safety from uh, the reach of those ruling parties. But Jesus is saying to them, let's go back to the heart of the beast, so to speak. Let's head right back into the situation that we escaped from just a few weeks before. And so this really takes the disciples um, somewhat by surprise. It seemed that maybe when uh, the Lord did not immediately respond to the plea from Mary and Martha for him to come and see Lazarus, they, Lazarus, they, they breathed a sigh of relief and uh, they recognized that, okay, we're going to be here and this is good. And then out of the blue, the Lord shatters their feeling of safety and says, let's go to Judea again. And uh, so this messes their timing up. And it seems that that's kind of the way the Lord works. Whatever he chooses to do, it stomps on somebody's idea of what proper timing would be. And uh, notice Jesus' answer. And I, this is, there are actually the two main themes that I talked about. Jesus' humanity and divinity being on display next to each other. And the overall theme of God's timing and God's providence and the way that God orchestrates these things. As a, I guess you might say, a sub-bullet under that uh, idea of God's providence and God's timing. There are two topics that the Lord will address here in close proximity to each other by the time we get to verse 16. There are two specific topics that the Lord will deal with. One of them we see him address here in verse number 9. And that is just time itself. And uh, the, uh, the providence and the ordering, the or ordination, the ordaining of activities that comes from God. The disciples are concerned. When we were in Judea last, they tried to stone you. You had to pull a fast one to get out of there. And now you want to just walk right back in there. Why would you go back into a situation of danger? This is a very pertinent question for us today. There are differences of opinion about the situation we find ourselves in regarding this pandemic and the disease that's there. And uh, some say we should can't throw all caution to the wind. And some say we need to use wisdom, we need to be more careful. And if we're not too careful about all of that, we can become fearful, much like these disciples. Now, wait a minute, Lord, we don't want to presume the grace of God. You know, they could have gotten pretty theological with the Lord. You were able to get out of Jerusalem, and uh, now you want to put yourself back in harm's way again. You want to walk right back into danger. Is this really what you want to do? Is this really the right approach? Is this proper? Is this appropriate? And notice how the Lord responds. It seems, um, at least initially to me, I thought, what is the Lord saying here? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth because there is no light in him. The first key point is that initial question, are there not 12 hours in the day? Now that seems like an obscure saying, but I suspect that it was a proverb that was, uh, bore some familiarity to them and they understood. Think about this, who, <clears throat> who ordained the day? Where does the day come from? Well, you go back to Genesis chapter 1, God divided the light from the darkness, the light he called the day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. God was the one who ordained the day. Jesus seems to be saying to the disciples, you know, no matter what happens, boys, there's 12 hours in the day. You can't lengthen the
Jesus was saying, my time has come. In those early confrontations with Jewish leaders, he would um, allow the conflict to rise to a certain level and then he would make his escape at the critical point because he knew that this was not the right time and this was not the right manner. And they tried multiple times to kill him. They took up stones. They did a number of different things, but the time was not right. And John is very careful to record certain events that Jesus went up to Jerusalem at the feast, or he was in this place in the days leading up to the feast, or it was six days before the Passover and Jesus was in Bethany, and so on and so forth. It's, John is relaying to us the importance of, of timing. And this is the... Uh, I guess this first little sub-bullet under the idea of God and His providential planning and, and God's time is that, is that Jesus very much does care about time. And what He says here, are there not 12 hours in the day? We can really, if we think about this a bit, we can glean a few things from this. The first thing, He's allaying the fear somewhat of the disciples. Don't be afraid that life is going to be cut short because nobody can shorten it. In other words, it's God that put 12 hours in the day. It's God that ordained the length of the day. And it will be God that will protect that length and that there is nothing that man can do to shorten that length of time. And I think that is a, a message that we need to hear. We need to have a comfort that God is at work in our lives and that God has ordained our days. You will remember what the Lord said to the prophet Jeremiah, before you were in your mother's belly, I knew you. And when you were in the womb, I ordained you a prophet. God had a plan for, for Jeremiah. And even the psalmist said in Psalm 139, that, that beautiful psalm, he talked about all of the various things that God knew and um, how that God was ever present. And you can read down through that psalm and it talks about the greatness of God. And, and, uh, and the psalmist said, you know, if I, if I fly away into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in hell or in the grave, you are you're already there. Everywhere I go, you are there. And I suppose to the unbeliever and to one running from God, that would be discomforting and it would be a frightening thing. But for the believer, for the one who trusts in God, that is great comfort to know that wherever we go, God is already there and that we're not exploring these things on our own, but God is already there and He's already at work in the events and the circumstances of our lives. But if you read further on down, he talks about, the psalmist does in that 139th Psalm, about how that um, he was knit together in his mother's womb and that God was acquainted with his substance even at that point and that in the book of God, all of my members were written. He's talking about the days of my life, that my substance was formed and God was the one that was at work in me putting all of this together and that my days are written in his book and that, that my days are uh, recorded and they are, they are ordained of God. And what Jesus is saying to these disciples, there's 12 hours in the day, boys, and when it's time, it's time. But if it's not time... There's nothing that anybody can do to shorten our days. This is great comfort to us. This is not an argument for being foolhardy. This is not an argument for throwing caution to the wind. You know, when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, Satan was tempting him and took him up and took him to a high temple, high place on the temple, and said to him, you know, the scripture says that the angels will bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. 
And so why don't you just throw yourself off of this temple and uh, allow those angels and to do their job as they were promised to do according to the scripture? And Jesus' response was, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. What he was saying was, don't presume the grace of God. You take care of what you can take care of. You don't have to be foolish or foolhardy. You don't have to take unnecessary risks. <clears throat> but you also don't have to cower in fear because you are confident that God is the one who is ordaining our days and setting our days in order. This has been a difficult season in a number of ways. There is the uncertainty of the unknown, not understanding exactly how the disease works, not understanding how it impacts, and, and honestly, um, not necessarily gaining a lot of clarity on that as we go through things because it seems to be somewhat random. Uh, some get it, have very little effect, very little impact. Some get it, and they fight for their lives. And uh, as a church and as a congregation, we have um, suffered the loss, and we have known of those who have fought and lost to the disease. And there are others who have lost their battle with various disease in this season and our ability to comfort one another and our ability to gather together and to be the strength that the church body is intended to be has been somewhat impacted by all of these things. And uh, even beyond those that are close to us, and of course, we, our minds are immediately drawn to the cases that are so close to us, even just this week, the passing of Sister Becca Torres' father, and uh, in recent days, others who have um, been associated with our church and have lost loved ones and, and so forth, these things come to our minds, and they are close to our minds and hearts in these days. But I believe there is an injunction here in the Scripture that we can take comfort, that God is still in control. Even though we don't understand and even though it is not clear to us how all of these things work out, the Lord said to those disciples, there are 12 hours in the day. And there's nothing that you can do, the implication is, to shorten that time. And so even in our own lives as we uh, determine how we're going to move forward and we're seeking the Lord for direction and for strength, we can have courage and we can allow courage to rise up in us to say, God is ultimately the one who is in control and he can lead us. And if it's time to go to Judea, then we should be willing to go to Judea because there's 12 hours in the day and nothing that happens in Judea will be will impact the fact that there are those 12 hours in the day. The other implication of this, not only is it impossible for anyone else to shorten the day, it was ordained of God, but we should also recognize that the time that we have been given is time that the Lord has given us. And so the implication is that there is sufficient time for us to do what needs to be done. There is sufficient time for us to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. And we don't need to be so frantic and rushing around and trying to figure out um, how we're going to get it all done. If we are frantic, it is because we have done that to ourselves. God has given us a set of tasks to do, and He's given us the time in which to accomplish it. And we need to uh, be willing to rest in a measure in that and be understanding and, and recognizing that God is the one who has put those things in place. But the injunction also is on us that that time has been given. And though man cannot shorten it, we also cannot lengthen it. And so it's imperative that we not waste our time. And if we are frantic and if we are rushing about, figuring out how we're going to get it all done in the time that has been allotted to us, maybe we need to pare some things away. Maybe we need to adjust and readjust some 
priorities and understand that there are some things that perhaps we're spending our time and our effort and our resources on that are not imperative to the Lord. And they are not crucial to God's mission and His purpose in our lives. So it's imperative that we not waste the time that God has given to us. We can't lengthen it just as it cannot be shortened so we can move in courage and we can move in uh, peace knowing that the purpose and the will of God will be accomplished. But we should also invite the Spirit of the Lord to talk to us about things that we are spending resources on that are not crucial. They are not mission critical. They are not the things that God would have us to do. So the Lord is concerned about time. And this is the question that he asks those disciples. And it's the encouragement that he gives them that it's okay to go to Judea when it's time to go back to Judea. It, then he continues the thought, If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of this world. But if he walk in the night, he stumbles, because there is no light in him. I think there's two levels to what the Lord is saying here. Of course, there is the natural sense. When it's daylight, when it's in the daytime, um, you can walk, you can work, you can accomplish what needs to be accomplished. You can allow the Spirit of the Lord to lead you and to work and to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. But there is a time coming when that light is taken away. And they didn't have street lights and they didn't have uh, ceiling lights and they didn't have all the artificial kinds of lights that we do now. So if a man was going to work, he had to work in the daytime. He could not afford to burn daylight, to waste time in the day. He had to get his work done before the sun went down. And the Lord had a way of forcing rest upon them because they could not see to work in the evening or in the night. And so they were forced to rest and to restore the strength to their bodies. But of course, there is also the spiritual application. Jesus had called himself the light of the world. And so he says to them, if any man walk in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. So there is a certain clarity for those disciples while they are with Jesus. He says, you can trust me, you can walk with me, you won't stumble because you have the light of the world. I am with you, just trust me and know that the days and the times are ordained and they are ordered of the Lord and, and God is accomplishing His purpose. But there is coming a time when that light is taken away and you will stumble about somewhat in the darkness. It was... It was a manner of warning to them, if you will, that there was a time that was coming and they needed to redeem the time that was available to them now, but that time was actually drawing to a close much more quickly than any of them really appreciated. And so <clears throat> the Lord was saying to them that they needed to take advantage and they needed to make use of the time that was available to them. The second topic that he um, addresses is not just the topic of time, but he then begins to address death. And uh, his view of death comes out in these verses, verses 11 through 16 or 17, and actually even through the remainder of the chapter. But I think there's something that we can glean here out of these words from the Lord. So in the tacked on to the end of his discussion and his encouragement of them that it was indeed time to go to Judea. Verse 11, John writes, These things said he, And after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. And of course, they did not understand what Jesus meant when he said that Lazarus was asleep. They thought that Lazarus was resting. And so the disciples said, Lord, if he sleep, he will do well. Jesus spake of his death. They thought he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. And so verse 14, Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now death is another one of these topics that we find ourselves bumping up against in these days. And it is instructive for us to consider how the Lord looks at death and how the Lord considered death, especially 
in this case with Lazarus. Now for the unbeliever, death is final and it is the end and it is uh, not a comforting thing and there is little comfort that can be provided from a spiritual standpoint. None of us long to go through the experience of losing a loved one, but it is instructive to us to observe what Jesus says. He says, our friend Lazarus sleepeth. So to Jesus, and from Jesus' perspective, Lazarus' death was a temporary state from which he would be awakened. He said, I go to awake him out of sleep. Now, the disciples should have known that the Lord was not talking literally of sleep because they know they've got a one-day journey ahead of them. Let's go to Judea. Okay, it'll take us a day to get there. Jesus says, Lazarus is asleep. He's not going to wake up until I get there. And when I get there, then I will awake him. That's quite a nap for someone. And uh, it's clear that what he's talking about is more than just natural sleep. I suppose it was wishful thinking on their part. Well, if Lazarus is sleeping, he's doing well. Maybe they're still trying to talk Jesus out of going to Judea. As if the Lord would say, oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, if Lazarus is asleep then he's resting and he's doing well. So you're right, boys, there's no need for us to go to Judea. And Jesus just kind of shakes his head and says, no, that's not what I mean at all. Lazarus is dead. In verse 15, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. There is... Uh, uh, there was at one of our conferences many years ago. It is interesting the way these verses flow together. And so the speaker took his uh, text from this passage and he entitled his message from the last phrase in verse 14 and the first phrase in verse 15. And the title of his message was Lazarus is dead and I'm glad. And it is an interesting thought to think the way that the Lord looks at the situation. First, he, he looks at the death of Lazarus. He just speaks of it as Lazarus is asleep. You'll remember when Jesus went in to uh, Jairus' daughter that he went and said that uh, she's only asleep. And the scripture said they mocked him to scorn. They thought, what a buffoon. He has no idea what he was talking about. But his perspective on death is different than our natural perspective on death. And uh, so, first of all, he says it is sleep, and then he says he will awake him out of sleep. And then he says, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad. Why would Jesus be glad that Lazarus was dead? I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. Clearly, the Lord is implying, if I were there, if I had been there, I would have been obligated to intervene and to heal him and to prevent his death. But what he's saying is that because I was not there, your faith is going to be strengthened because you're going to see an even greater miracle. Jesus is saying, with regard to Lazarus' death, I'm glad that I was not there when life left his body. Because when life left his body, that created an opportunity for me to do an even greater miracle and to work in an even more demonstrative way and to express in an even greater way what I am, who I am, and my purpose for coming. And Jesus says, I'm glad I was not there for this reason, to this intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, even though we weren't there, let's go now unto him. This is really focusing in again on Jesus' view of death. Our view of death is that it is so final because it 
brings to an end everything that we have known or been able to encounter with our senses and the world in which we live. Death ends all of that. But Jesus has a different perspective and he has a different view of this. And we're going we're gonna to explore this a little bit further next week and talk about this because our view of death, of course, is one that we, we it's our natural tendency to shrink back from because it is so final and there is pain. And we will see as we go through this chapter, Jesus himself is not immune to that pain. It's part of his humanity that is put on display alongside his divinity. And yet he knows, he knew before he left Bethany beyond Jordan, what he would do in Bethany of Judea. He knew before he ever started to walk back, he knew exactly what he would do because he said this would be for the glory of God. And yet, even with his great understanding, it did not make him immune to the pain that he would feel by experiencing and encountering the death of one that he held so dear. But he was also not just subject to that pain and to that difficulty. This is why Paul says, we don't sorrow like those who have no hope. Jesus' perspective was even greater and even more clear than our perspective. We can know certain things by faith and we know them in a measure intellectually based on what we have been told in Scripture. But Jesus' perspective was even greater than that. And he was trying to communicate that to his disciples, that this is a temporary situation that will be used for the glory of God. This should give us great comfort wherever we are today, whatever we're facing, whether it is the uncertainty of our times, the uncertainty of the season that we find ourselves in, or whether we're dealing with the death and the loss of a very close loved one. These words can give us great comfort that all of these things are working together in God's plan, though we may not understand it, and that the season that we find ourselves in and the difficulty that we find ourselves in is one that is temporary and that it has an end and that God's will will be accomplished and that He will be glorified in the things we find ourselves walking through. This is the promise of the believer, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them who are the called according to his purpose. He has ordained these things and he has put them in place and he has set them in motion. And I want to encourage you this morning to grab hold of that and trust in the power and the strength of the hand of the Lord. And we can understand that God is at work Let's pray that he would do that, that he would give us that peace that passes understanding this morning. Lord, we're so grateful for everything that you have done in our lives, grateful for the things that you have given to us, and that you've preserved your word, God, to be an encouragement in our hearts and in our minds. And I pray this morning that you would help us, regardless of the difficulties and circumstances that face us, to know, Lord, that you endured those things yourself. And that, Lord, you are the one who set all of these things in motion in our lives. And that you are walking through these situations with us. And that it is the power of your Spirit that can strengthen us and steal us to go through these circumstances. And as final as they may seem, help us, Lord, remind us that they are temporary in nature. The things that we see are temporal, but those things that are not seen, those are the eternal things. And that how great is the glory that will be revealed in us, even when compared to the things that we must go through. We ask, Lord, that your will would be accomplished in our lives and that you would be with us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Lord bless you. So glad again that you could be with us. Hope that you'll join our morning worship at 11 a.m., trusting that the Lord will strengthen and will encourage you and allow the Spirit of the Lord to speak to your heart this morning and give you great courage as we go through these difficult days. Lord bless you. We'll see you soon.